Dr. Rico here. This is a lecture from my mini course, Robotic Planning and Kinematics. The syllabus and notes are in the description. 3.3, Example Configuration Spaces, part of the chapter on configuration spaces. We now present some examples of configuration spaces, the operative word of this, for simple robots presented above. Configuration space for translating planar robots. In this first example, we consider the disk robot and the polygonal robot that may only translate and not rotate. For these two robots, we silently assume the existence of a constraint prohibiting the robot from rotating. As shown in figure 3.6 below, we designate a specific point of the robot to be the reference point. For example, the center of the body, this dot, and we see it in different positions here. Given a reference frame in space, we will discuss the concept of reference frame further, beginning in section 6, chapter 6 of this book. Place the robot such that its reference point lies at the origin of the reference frame. Let B of 0, 0 denote the set of points belonging to the robot when the robot is at the reference position 0, 0, right here. Any other placement, B of Q, of the robot is specified by two parameters, i.e. by a point Q, QX and QY, in the plane R2. So here would be B at QX being 2, QY being 1, B at QX being 1, QY being 2. Okay. Therefore, the configuration space of the robot is Q equals R2, and a configuration Q is equal to qx qy which is in the configuration space q it's simply a point in the plane r2 the robot has two degrees of freedom since two parameters are required to specify its configuration configuration space of the one link robot the configuration q of the one link robot is given by the angle of the link relative to a reference axis for example the horizontal axis the configuration space Q is then the set of all angles. There are two ways we can represent the set of angles. The first is simply as an interval, where we include negative pi and we exclude the other endpoint pi, where the number negative pi is included in the interval and the number pi is excluded. In this representation, one must remember that negative pi are the same angle as shown in figure 3.7, which can cause problems when calculating distances between angles. So if you see here, when we have an angle, this is going to wrap back around on itself. So if you go from negative pi, you keep increasing the angle until you reach pi, you're actually back now at negative pi. Okay? You can also think of it on the unit circle like this, as we will in just a moment. The second way, as shown in figure 3.7, A, is to represent the set of angles as the set of points on the unit radius circle. Okay, the unit radius circle can be shown in the plane xy like this. We define the unit circle as S1. This is some important notation. S1, the set in the plane points xy at which x squared plus y squared equals 1 where the symbol S1 is used because the unit radius circle is also the unit radius one-dimensional sphere, okay? Sphere we typically think of as being three-dimensional, but this is what's called the one-dimensional sphere. The circle naturally captures the fact that negative pi and pi are the same angle. So if you start at negative pi on the unit circle over here, and you increase from negative pi to negative pi over 2 to 0 to pi over 2 to pi, it's easy to see here that it's actually the same angle. That's why we like this. It's able to capture the fact that we've gone around in a circle completely. Okay? It required an extra variable, though, x and y, to get there. In summary, the configuration space of the one-link robot is the circle Q equal to S1. And a configuration Q can be thought of either as a point XY on the circle or as the corresponding angle theta defined by X equal cosine theta and Y equal sine theta. See figure 3.8.
So here we have this configuration map from the unit sphere, the unit circle, uh, to the workspace. Okay, the configuration map takes you to the workspace. And this point here corresponds to this angle here. All right. We will usually write the configuration simply as an angle theta in S1. The one link robot has one degree of freedom since its configuration can be described by a single angle. Configuration space of the roto translating planar robot. The configuration of a planar object that translates and rotates is x, y, the two translational positions, and theta, the orientation. So x and y uh, is the position of the reference point, and theta is the angle of the body measured counterclockwise with respect to the positive horizontal axis, as we usually do. The configuration space of a roto-translating polygon is Q equals the Cartesian product of R2, the plane, and S1. S1 tells us the orientation, right? The angle that it's rotated to. The robot has three degrees of freedom. Figure 3.9 illustrates the configuration map. Here is this figure. So we have a configuration map, and X and Y are the far plane on this figure. And theta is the axis coming towards us, coming out of the board, if you will. So this is a three-dimensional space, and this configuration map takes us then to the workspace of the robot. All right. In later chapters, we will study this configuration space as the matrix group of planar displacements. Okay, We need a little group theory before that. All right. The next one. Configuration space of robots moving in three dimensions. Robots moving in three dimensions may rotate or rototranslate in three-dimensional Euclidean space. In figure 310, we drew a cube. We illustrate a three-dimensional robot composed of a single rigid body. All right. We postpone a detailed treatment of the configuration space for such robots to the later chapters on kinematics and rotation matrices. We'll get there. For now, let us just mention that an unconstrained single rigid body robot has six degrees of freedom, three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. So of course, it can translate in three dimensions and it can also rotate in three dimensions. Configuration space of a multi-link robot. Configuration space of the two-link robot brings up some interesting issues, as in figure three, 11, let L1 and L2 be the lengths of the first and second link. So we have L1, we have L2. All right, let theta1 denote the angle of the first link measured counterclockwise with respect to the positive horizontal axis. There is our theta1. And let L2 denote the angle of the second link measured counterclockwise with respect to the first link. So theta2 is measured with respect to the first link. That's important. Uh, some Conventions will measure it also from the horizontal, but it's useful in applications like this to actually use the angle with respect to the other link because that's something that's more easily measured than with respect to the horizon, say. All right. Therefore, the configuration Q of the two-link robot is described by the two angles theta1 and theta2. The configuration space is then the Cartesian product of one of the unit spheres and another of the unit spheres. We will write theta one comma theta two to be equal to S1 cross S1 or the Cartesian product of S1 and S1 or slightly less precisely theta one theta two in negative pi to pi, Cartesian product of negative pi to pi, those two intervals. All right, it is useful to define the two torus or simply torus as the product of two circles. So S1 cross S1 is the torus, the two torus. The torus can be depicted in two symbolic ways. See figure 312 here. The left figure illustrates how the torus can be drawn as a square in the plane, but where one, the vertical on the left, is identified with the vertical segment on the right, and two, the horizontal segment on the top is identified with the horizontal segment on the bottom. Okay, we're 
making a connection there. So if we take a look at this figure, part A of the figure, we have the left and the right. And we can imagine in our minds, hopefully, this side and this side actually being glued together, if you had a piece of paper, gluing those together. So now you've got a sort of cylindrical tube. And then you also glue together the top and the bottom, uh, which the top and the bottom, if, if you paste those together, that would create a tube that's circular, which is what we see the figure in B doing. Of course, the paper would have to stretch and deform, but this is topology and that's allowed. So, all right, that's this form. The right figure is the two torus drawn in three dimensions. The shape is often referred to as the donut. And this fill in the blank then would have been a donut hole within which we placed a donut. I don't know. All right, note, the donut shape is obtained by one, preparing a square flat sheet and two, gluing together vertical left with vertical right and horizontal top with horizontal bottom segments, okay? Okay, so we now have this representation of the two torus, and that is our configuration space. So our configuration map takes us from the two torus to the workspace again. And for this dot here, this specific configuration, we would map that to this specific configuration in the workspace, right? Which would be the angles about 30 degrees and about 40 degrees. Um, that's what we have as the two different link angles. All right. The two sphere in three dimensions is the set of points in R3 at unit distance from the origin. In a formula, it's this set of points x, y, z in R3 such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. The two torus and the two sphere are two sets that can be described by two angles. However, the two torus is substantially different from the two sphere. In S2, each closed path can be deformed continuously to a point because S2 has no holes okay the two torus instead has a hole and it contains closed paths that cannot be continuously deformed to a point because you get stuck on that inner hole the two sphere is usually drawn quite differently from how the two torus is drawn for example you have this world map that would be one way to represent a sphere right on a planar piece of paper. So the important takeaway about the two sphere versus the two torus is that for a two link manipulator, we actually have a topology that corresponds to a two torus and not, as you might have thought, a two sphere. A two sphere is not the proper topology of a two link robot manipulator. And uh, that's what we were going for here. So we didn't get the two sphere, even though it's closely associated with what's going on here. Instead, we have the two torus. The two torus is what we're looking for. So what we've covered is some different examples of configuration spaces. For the next lecture, we'll be talking about forward and inverse kinematics. I hope you join in. See you next time.